It's good to be here. Welcome to the Mahesh Chandra Rigmi Lecture. This began in 2003, so it's been quite an amazing number of years that this has continued. Giving continuity to the illustrious names of people who have been the presenter, it has been an honor to have Professor Chaitanya Mishra to be the presenter today. We would like to welcome you all and also welcome Dr. Mishra, who has, after his retirement, not retired actually, is still as active as ever, and this is one testimony to his really active involvement in social sciences in Nepal, and one of the pioneer sociologists who has been instrumental in giving a quality of education especially higher education in Tribune University today. It is once again my honor and pleasure to be welcoming Dr. Mishra. And to do further honors, I would like to call upon Dr. Sudhinder Sharma, member of Social Science Baha, to provide an overview of today's talk program. Sudhinder. Thank you, you uh, Dwaiti ji. I am Sudendra Sharma, a board member of Social Science Baha. Uh, on behalf of Social Science Baha, I would like to welcome you all for this year's Mahishandra Regmi lecture to be delivered by Professor Chaitanya Mishra. I have been asked to give a few introductory remarks and mention a little bit about my acquaintance with Professor Mishra before Mishra goes into his actual presentation. It's an honor to be introducing Professor Chaitanya Mishra. My acquaintance with Professor Mishra, whom I continue to call Chaitanya Sir, dates to around 1987 when I was a master's level student in sociology at Triban University. And Chaitanya Sir was a reader in the central department of sociology and anthropology. During the time that I was at TU, Chaitanya sir was on a deputation at Sinas. I had first approached him to talk, after, to talk to him after reading his articles. Although he was not lecturing and did not know me personally, he gave time to talk and interact. I remember first approaching him in his room in the Sinas building, which used to be in the northern wing, first floor, adjoining the rooms of Professor Dhruva Kumar and Krishna Hatichu. After completing my course, I approached him to ask if he would be willing to supervise me during thesis writing. I wanted to examine a social dimension of a development program at that time, and uh, Chaitanya sir willingly accepted, and that was the beginning of our relationship. Chaitanya was approachable to students who read and were genuinely interested in sociology. Sociology had not become fashionable those days. I remember a friend of mine from my school days chiding me for studying a subject that generally only girls study. At around that time, only about 50 to 60 students would be formally enrolled and around 30 students would be attending the classes regularly. We all know what classes have been like in subsequent years. Even as early as 1987, Chaitanya was becoming a known figure. And since he had a few publications, students were looking forward to meeting him, interacting him, and listening to his lectures. I continued my interaction with Chaitanya after completing my second master's degree in sociology from Ateneo de Manila University in the Philippines. He gave time to and listened and encouraged his students. For instance, in my case, it was his willingness to be a resource person in a course that I used to teach. The course used to be called Immersion Course on Contemporary Social Issues that began in 1998 and continued till uh, 2009. He would be willing to come as a resource person when approached. And this entailed you know, traveling all the way from Gyaneswar to Patandoka early in the morning for the lectures. And likewise, 
Once the Nepal School of Social Sciences and Humanities began the graduate diploma course, I have been privileged many times to have Chaitanya Sar as a resource person. The second time Chaitanya Sar was involved in my dissertation was when I was working on my PhD at the University of Tampere in Finland. Finnish universities have the custom of having external reviewers review the dissertation once it is approved by the candidate's direct supervisors. For a period over six months in 2000, as an external reviewer, he gave substantive comments and feedback and helped bring the dissertation to a standard where it could be published as a book. It would not be incorrect to say that today, Chaitanya Mishra's name has become synonymous with the discipline of sociology in Nepal. We cannot talk about sociology in Nepal without mentioning the name of Chaitanya Mishra. Along with Dorbadar Bista, Mishra is one of the founders of the Central Department of Sociology and Anthropology at Trivan University. Along with establishing the department, Mishra has nurtured the department and saw it grow over the years. He has chaired the, chaired the department, has taught courses regularly, and has supervised numerous students, some of whom have already become professors, readers, and lecturers in the central department and in colleges in different parts of Nepal. In a sense, Chaitanya Misra is our own C. Wright Mills and Talcott Parsons in one. Like C. Wright Mills, Mishra has pointed out what it means to inculcate a sociological imagination as can be seen in the various academic and journalistic writings he has produced over the years. And also like Mills, finds a Marxist approach for understanding societal purposes very useful. Like the Harvard professor Talcott Parsons, in his days where he had almost become synonymous with sociology in the United States, so too Chaitanya Mishra in the Nepali context. Like Parsons, Mishra has dedicated almost four decades of his life to teaching and promoting sociology. Generally, Mishra has not been a Bill Parsons, but very much a historical grounded analyst of the kind that one sees in Wallace Stein. There have, however, been instances where one sees glimpses at system buildings in Mishra's writing. Professor Mishra has, to his credit, over 10 single-authored, co-authored, and edited books, over 30 articles, and over 100 journalistic articles. Some of his recent single-authored and edited books include Ethnicity and Federalization in Nepal, 2012, Badlido Nepali Samaj, 2010, Essays on the Sociology of Nepal, 2007, Punjivad versus Nepal, 2006. The list is long. Another of his specialties is that he is as prolific in his Nepali writings as he is in English. In his writings, he has covered a wide variety of issues from UN Human Development Report to the effects and impacts of foreign aid and of migration. In whatever he has put his hands on, his outputs have been of a high standard, and the concerned work has tended to be widely cited in that particular area. What fascinates me in his writings are, one, his ability to use a particular theoretical framework, in this instance, Marxism, to examine societal processes. Two, his explorations into what capitalism has done in Nepal. Three, history of the political economy of Nepal. And four, his examination of how Nepal began to integrate into the capitalist world economy and what have been its effects and consequences in Nepali society. I've, ten, I've liked the way in which he asks big questions and sets about answering them. During the past several years, Mishra has become very much of a public intellectual. He has written important opinion pieces in leading Nepali dailies. He has made his mark as an opinion columnist that is able to influence ongoing public discourses. Many do not know that he is an early bird in many aspects of his life. He got a Colombo Plant Scholarship to do his master's in India. At that time, he was just 19 years old. Then he got a Fulbright Hayes Fellowship to do graduate studies in the United States. He was just 26, 27 when he completed his PhD. He became a full-fledged professor of sociology when he was only 40 years old. 
Once again, recollecting the time that I first came to know him, I remember some girls who were two batches senior to me at that time in the department telling me that the name Chaitanya Misra must be of a bearded old man, presumably in his late 50s. They must have been, have had this impression because Chaitanya Sir had already a few publications then and was a name in circulation even at that time. They were amazed to find a young and at that time a handsome bachelor in his mid-thirties and I remember some almost becoming infatuated after meeting him and listening to his lecture. It is my honor to welcome Professor Chaitanya Misra to deliver the 2014 Mahesh Chandra Regmi public lecture. The title of Professor Misra's lecture is What Led to the 2006 Democratic Revolutions in Nepal? Thank you, Professor Misra. Before you begin, uh -huh. we have to okay. have this feature. Uh, thank you all so much. Uh, I'm a bit nervous before this large audience. Uh, I hope I can do justice uh, to all of you today here. Uh, when I was invited to deliver the uh, Mahesh Chandra Legumi lecture, I felt uh, greatly privileged. Um, I have come to know about Nepal for, from very many persons. I have had very many good teachers. But uh, if I had to single out one single person, that would certainly be Mahesh Chandra Legumi. Uh, I have learned so much from him. I bet many of you have read his books and learned similarly as well. So I think uh, we must uh, express our gratefulness uh, to my son Regmi, who has given so, so much to all of us. I also need to thank today to uh, uh, Social Science Baha and Mr. Deepak Thapa uh, for asking me to deliver the lecture today. Uh, by way of preface, uh, prefacing, uh, there are two kinds of explanations that are prevalent in social sciences in general. One uh, emphasizes history and structure, and the other emphasizes human will, agency. The best way to explain any social action or any social institution or structure is by combining history and structure on the one hand and agency on the other. But it is so often the case that we tend to emphasize one at the expense of the other. That's what happened, I think, uh, in explaining uh, the political transition or what we like to call the democratic republican revolution of 2006. The most <clears throat> popular explanation uh, for that 2006 revolution, uh, if you look at the press uh, and if you ask people, would emphasize agency and human will. People would tell you that it was the parliamentary parties, democratic parties, the Maoists and the civil society which which brought about the, it's okay. Which brought about the 2006 Democratic Republican Revolution. That is certainly one way to look at it. But that's only partially valid. One has to bring in history and structure together with agency in order to explain the Democratic Revolution. That is one of the key points I will emphasize in my presentation today. In fact, it's not only, Nep not only in Nepal in explaining uh, revolutions or any other political or social transitions that the that agency has been highlighted. In fact, <clears throat> there have been three waves of theoretical explanations 
which have tried to uh, tell us why democratic revolutions happen. The most recent explanation goes by the name of third wave of explanation of democratic revolutions. The third wave is led by people like uh, Samuel, Hunt, Samuel Hunt Huntington, Aaron Leipart, Juan Lynch, uh, Alfred Stepan, Philip Smitter, and so forth. They, Samuel Huntington, for instance, uh, notes that democracy can be crafted. Like any other thing, it doesn't require a particular history or structure for democracy to arise in, a, in any country. He says it can be crafted, it can be manufactured. If I can, if I can read uh, his lines to you. Democracy is no longer treated as a particularly rare and delicate plant that cannot be transplanted in alien soil. It is treated as a product that can be manufactured wherever there is a democratic craftsmanship and the proper zeitgeist. Okay? So, he, Huntington, as can be seen, emphasizes agency and human will in the manufacturing or in the crafting of a democratic revolution. Similarly is the case with, for instance, Leibhardt. He also notes that uh, democracy is not merely a superstructure that grows out of socioeconomic and cultural basis, bases. It has an independent life of its own. So here is another one that emphasizes human agency and human will. In fact, uh, in a review of literature, uh, that was published in 1998, uh, Shin notes that, uh, again, I want to read it to you. The establishment of a Bible democracy in a nation is no longer seen as the product of higher levels of modernization, bourgeois class structure, tolerant cultural values, and economic independence from external actors. Instead, it is seen more as a product of strategic interactions and arrangements among politi political el elites, conscious choices among various types of democratic constitutions and electoral and party systems. So, one line is clear. One line, this line emphasizes human agency that, and says that democracy can be crafted just about out of nothing. If you have the will, then democracy can be crafted. But this, is, but this is a partial view, but as I said, it's very popular, including in Nepal. The 2006, if I were to repeat it, uh, the most usual explanation given in Nepal for 2006 democratic revolution was in terms of political parties and civil society. The seven parties and the Maoist alliance and the so-called civil society. Now, it can be, from my point of view at least, uh, this perspective is extremely a theoretical, theoretically nihilistic. It doesn't really try to explain why democracies arise, why democratic revolution takes place. It doesn't explain, it doesn't have a historical bent, it doesn't have a structural bent. It does not implicate either history or a structure or a combination of those two in order, to exp in order to explain democratic revolution or any other kind of political structuring, restructuring. <clears throat> now, these, both of these are extremely important, agency and uh, uh, Structure. I want to uh, read out two lines from Marx. The first line emphasizes agency. Agency is significant, Marx writes, not because history is not, he says, history is not, as it were, a person apart, using man as a means to achieve its own aims. Ideas cannot carry anything at all, carry out anything at all. In order to carry out ideas, 
men are needed who can exert, exert practical force. So you can see that Marx emphasizes human agency, that you need people to carry out anything. History cannot, on its own, do anything. History is what people do. Now, this highlights agency. On the other hand, Marx also, in a more celebrated, in more celebrated lines, emphasizes history and structure. He says, men make their own history, but they do not make it just as they please. They do not make it under circumstances chosen by themselves, but under circumstances directly encountered, given, and transmitted from the past. So here is a combination of human agency and will on the one hand, and history and structure on the other. It was, in fact, to underline the necessity, requirement of both history and structure and human agency and will to act together that Anthony Giddens, for instance, coined the term structuration. The implication was that history and structure on the one hand, and human agency and will were not two separate things. These were really, this was really one thing. He was, Giddens was saying, society is within us, within each of us. We are persons, individuals, but we are socially constructed. So when we do something, when we will something, we do not will it in, a, in a, a historical and a structural manner. Our will is structured by history. So the fact that we, are, we will in an individual sense does not imply at all that we are not being historical or structural because we are socially constructed. So, uh, the second section I want to come to now is uh, those theories uh, which would go under the second wave of explanation of democratic revolutions. These theories emphasize uh, structure and history. Uh, most of those researchers, social scientists who engage in comparative historical research fall into this category. They see democracy as a contingent outcome of specific flows of political and economic structures. So flows of political and economic structures, particular flows give rise to democracy. That's the gist, I suppose. However, uh, I think there is a um, serious shortcoming in the literature. I find in the comparative historical literature, I do not find due emphasis given to the rise of capitalism for the rise of democracy. I think uh, capitalism is foundational to, to democratic revolution and democratization. This is not emphasized, this is not given a center stage in studies of democratic revolution. Capitalism is not a sufficient condition for the rise of democracy, but it is a necessary condition. If we review uh, different structures of production or modes of production, we can see that uh, democracy is prevalent where there is capitalism. Without capitalism, you cannot find any instance or near, you cannot find only in rare instances, which need to be analyzed further, by the way, only in rare instance, instance if at all, you, can have, you have democracy where there is no capitalism. Now, this does not mean that if you have capitalism, you have, if you have democracy. That, that's not the case.
as uh, Barrington Moore told us in his 1966 book, Social or Origins of Dictatorship and Democracy, capitalism or modernization, in his words, can lead to three different outcomes. Capitalism does not, capitalism or, or modernization <coughs> did not necessar necessarily lead to democracy. It led to three contingent outcomes. Modernization led uh, to bourgeois democracy or social democracy, that's one. Two, uh, modernization led to uh, communism. He was reviewing the uh, experience uh, between 1850 and 1950, basically. His reference point was that century. So, modernization, uh, one outcome, or capitalism, one outcome was uh, bourgeois democracy to social democracy. The second outcome was communism. The third outcome was fascism. So, capitalism could lead to three Capitalism could lead to a forked road. It forked in three directions. Bourgeois democracy, uh, communism, and fascism. Now, he said, I mean, his equation was extremely simple. He said, it all depends on uh, class alliances. If the landlords and the bourgeoisie ally themselves against peasants, the result would be fascism. Once again, if the landlords allied themselves with the bourgeoisie, the result would be fascism. If the bourgeoisie and the peasants came together, it would be bourgeois democracy to arrange between bourgeois democracy and social democracy. Third, if the peasants were so heavy and could prevail, then the result would be communism. So you had, you had three outcomes, depending on how classes aligned themselves. That was the essence of uh, Barrington Moore's argument. So you had history and structure very closely implicated in explaining democratic revolutions. Now, why do I say that capitalism is a necessary, although not a sufficient condition for the rise of democracy? Capitalism continuously invalidates the so-called tradition. it continually invalidates what was valid before. And this is captured uh, very well, once again, in the lines uh, put out by Marx. I want to read that to you. And, and uh, surprisingly, this line, these lines come from the Communist Manifesto. The bourgeoisie historically has, this is a fairly long quote, the bourgeoisie historically has played a most revolutionary part. The bourgeoisie, wherever it has got the upper hand, has put an end to all feudal, patriarchal, idyllic relations. It has pitilessly torn asunder the motley of ties that bound man to his natural, quote unquote, natural superiors. The bourgeoisie has torn away from the family its sentimental veil. Constant revolutionizing of production, uninterrupted disturbance of all social conditions, everlasting uncertainty and agitation distinguish the bourgeoisie from all earlier ones. All fixed, fast, frozen relations with the train of ancient and venerable prejudices and opinions are swept away. All newly formed ones become antiquated before they can ossify. All that is solid melts into, melts into air all that is holy is profaned. So this is how capitalism proceeds, by invalidating 
the past, not only the past of other modes of production, for instance, the feudal mode of production, but also it also invalidates its own past continually. Okay? So if you have a capitalist system uh, now, this capitalist system arose by invalidating the capitalist system 50 years ago or 25 years ago. The essence, of course, remains the same, profit and reinvestment, but every other thing becomes a matter of the past. Okay? So capitalism is very adept at throwing out the debris of the past. So this is one condition why uh, it leads to newer forms of uh, governance to, to the democratic form. Um, uh, I might draw uh, one uh, phrase from the Nobel Prize winning author V.S. Nepal. Uh, he wrote a book about India. This was, I think, 87 or so. The book was titled India, A Million Mutinies. I mean, you were, I mean, he encountered people, individuals and groups who were rebelling against their past who are rebelling against older social relations and older social norms. Okay? Whenever, he whenever he met people across his travel in India, uh, he could see people uh, validating new ways of thinking, new ways of doing, new ways of justifying emergent structures. I think we are all seeing that in Nepal. We have been all seeing that in Nepal from 1980s onwards as well. I'll detail how, uh, what are the components of such uh, mutinies. I'll do that a bit, bit later. Now I come to another author. Uh, uh, she is uh, Theda Swatchpole uh, from Harvard. Um, she says there are five contingent conditions of a democratic revolution. Five contingent conditions. One is the nature of class relations, as uh, this has been emphasized by almost all authors. Uh, for the rise of democracy, class relations uh, must take certain shape. So she does the same. Number one, for a democratic revolution to take place, class relations have to be structured in a particular manner. Two, class relations, however, did not lead to democracy by themselves. Class relations have to be organized. And uh, a democ democratic agenda has to be implemented by, a, by an organized political force, for instance, a party. Uh, this was, in fact, uh, also she was deferring uh, on this to Lenin and Tilly and other mm, politicians and authors. Third, a revolution was not merely a national affair. A revolution could not be bound within the, within the limits of a nation. A revolution necessarily had international components. That is, neighbors, and far, neighbors near and far and the entire world system impinged on any democratic revolution. So a democratic revolution in a nation was not, a, was, not, was not an entirely national affair. It was an international affair at the same time. Particularly, neighbors were, who were more developed in a capitalist sense, influenced democratic revolution in nations, countries, or states which were less developed in terms of less developed capitalistically. So intervention, political intervention had an had economic roots. For she said a state was 
rel a relatively autonomous organization. Unlike in the Marxist uh, rendering, in which a state is almost akin to a class. Okay, the, uh, Marx, for instance, said, uh, state was, was an organization of the ruling class. That's Theta Scotspol does not agree with that. She says, this, uh, all states have a certain level of autonomy. So how autonomy was played out also shaped the kind of revolution one had. Finally, Whether, whether, whether or not resources in a country were well distributed shaped the course of the revolution and the outcome of, of the revolution. She said, for instance, that if ownership was well highly distributed, for instance, in a sense, we could say land ownership in Nepal, which is I mean, you have 80, 90 percent of households which own, own land here. Of course, there is inequality, but ownership is fairly widespread. In such a situation, such a situation also obtained, for instance, in uh, 1789 France. In such a situation, revolutionary forces cannot control the economy, cannot seize the economy. Revolutionary forces can seize economy when, only when assets, resources are concentrated in a few hands. It is very diff difficult for a revolutionary force to seize household resources, productive resources, if it is well distributed. So these are the five contingent conditions uh, for the rise of a revolution and the way the revolution takes shape. I want to bring in, implicate two other authors, uh, two other set of authors. Uh, one is uh, Dietrich Ruschemeyer, Evelyn Stephens, and John Stephens, uh, who have written a book called uh, Capitalist Development and, Demo and Democracy. They emphasize class, the role of class again. Class, they think, is of fundamental significance. Class structure and class relations are of fundamental significance for the rise of a democratic revolution. One of the important points they make is that, two important points. One, um, when they say class, this, they define working class as the uh, share of workers in the manufacturing sector. sector. Revolution, they think, is successful, becomes successful when you have a large proportion of people who, are, who work in the manufacturing se sector. That is, the working class is very strong. That's how they define it. Two, on the, and on the other hand, uh, and they have reviewed uh, they reviewed many cases from uh, Europe, Latin America, uh, and Caribbean, basically. Where, uh, okay, one, the, the first emphasis, emphasis was on the working class, the manufacturing workers, basically. The other emphasis, so wherever you had a large-sized manufacturing class, uh, they would, uh, struggle for democracy. The other category of peoples, let's say, who would struggle for democracy would be the independent smallholders. This was the, cap. This was the case, for instance, uh, in France, uh, in Denmark, Norway, Sweden, Finland, Netherlands, and a number of other countries which uh, Let's see. Uh, Sweden, Denmark, Norway, Switzerland, Belgium, Netherlands, France. These were smallholder countries in which these peasants, small independent peasants, 
fought on the side of dem democracy. Not so with large farmers. Large farmers, as uh, Barrington Moore reminds us, are necessarily labor repressive. And, and democracy doesn't allow repression of labor. So large holders necessarily preferred a system in which, which was undemocratic so that labor repression could continue. But on the other hand, when you had smallholders, which were, who were not labor repressive because they worked out of their own household labor, family labor, they were pro-democracy. Finally, the final author I want to implicate before discussing Nepal is uh, uh, Guillermo O'Donnell. He, uh, he also reviewed a number of European cases, but basically South American, uh, Central and South American cases. <clears throat> he said, the condition of economic dependence encourages uh, centralization and bureaucracy. So he comes from, from the dependency school, uh, and his argument was that if you are economically dependent, uh, you are less likely to have democracy. Because, principally because uh, dependence creates strong bureaucracy. And dependence also creates classes which are not pro-democratic. Dependency has a, has a way of shaping classes and class relations which are inimical to the, to the rise of democracy. Okay, this is the, uh, what should I say, the contour of the dis theoretical discussion on democracy. These are the um, anchors I have laid out in order to discuss Nepal, 2006 Nepal. As I said, now I want to go to this section, uh, which is the main section really. I have been arguing in my uh, writings for a long time that uh, Nepal entered the Nepal had a capitalist mode of production, has had a mo capitalist mode of production for a very long time, and Nepal almost never had feudalism. It was a smallholder economy, mostly. And whatever landlordism Nepal had was first very unlike that in Europe, uh, from where the classic uh, indicators of feudalism come. It was Mahesha the Regni, really, who told us about, told the story of state, land, state landlordism. In Nepal, it was the, the state was the landlord, not a clan or a household or a person. The state appointed landlords at its will. The landlord, uh, landlordship, the landlordship was either awarded as a position, official position, for a specific duration, or else landlordship was farmed out. It was contracted. You, have to, you pay so much money to the government, you get landlordship over this particular region, this particular set of hamlets, this particular village. So a landlord did not have an independent political standing. It did not have a military. Landlordship was not extremely highly exalted as it was in many parts of Europe. Landlordship was granted under the state, under, by the government. Okay? It appointed landlords. 
it will be appointed somebody else five years later or 10 years later or 20 years later. So, Maestro Egmi, he gave us the term state landlordism. And this is crucial. This is of fundamental importance. Now, as I said, uh, why do I say uh, Nepal has had the capitalist mode for a very long time? I, uh, for me, the capitalism, has, whether it's uh, a country has or has not capitalism as against feudalism or any other mode, uh, can be decided on the basis of four tests, let's say. First, how well distributed the asset is, productive resources are. Are they well distributed or are they highly concentrated? As I said earlier, Nepal, uh, in Nepal, if we consider farm land as the most important asset, we have known for a long time that um, 70, 80, 90 percent of all households, even 95 percent of households at certain periods, own land. It was not like 5 percent or 10 percent of households owning land and the rest working for the landlords. So it has been an independent peasant economy for a very, very long time. Independent peasants rule. Now, if you had feudalism, obviously you would have a very small proportion of landowners and large proportion of attached workers, attached agricultural workers. That was, that was almost never the case here. So that is one test. That tells, that tells us that certainly Nepal did not have a, had feudalism in its for a very, very long time, for as long as we care to remember. Two, second test is how is labor organized? You do not have, you have feudalism if labor is attached. If you have slavery, if you have serfdom, or somehow labor is attached to the landlord. You do not, if you, you do not have, have contract labor, in other words, you have something other than capitalism. Now, some labor has had been attached in the past, had, did have an attached kind of nature. But it was a very, very small proportion to begin with. Now, the current data tell us that, tells, tell us that uh, only about 2% two th two if at all, of all labor is attached. That it is a dependent labor, dependent on the landlord or other employers. So free labor, more or less, has been the rule for a very long time. This is the second test. Now let me explain these two um, indicators. In, in, the, in the 50s and 60s, certain steps were taken by different governments in Nepal, which led to the expansion of independent holdings, the small peasants. For instance, you had uh, abolition of rent-free land, what we call in Nepali birta abolition, abolition of the birta system, in the 50s. You had... Uh, Land reforms, uh, also another set of land reforms in the 60s. The 60 land reform has been reviewed negatively by many commentators. commentators that they say it did not uh, really succeed. Now, success is a very relative term. My own data and my own uh, reading tells me, tell me that it was a fairly successful land reform initiative. What did, what did the land reforms in the 60s do? It did four or five things, five important things. One, uh, 
it regulated the share of the produce which, goes to the, which went to the landlord versus that which went to the tenant. Two, it uh, instituted a system of upper ceilings in land holding. Three, the tenant, unlike in most countries, were made owners of the, owners of the land they tilled, part of the land they tilled, the, a, tenant, a tenant tilled was, came under his ownership or her ownership. The tilling household had right to some of the land tilled. Uh, I forgot the fourth point. Fifth, for the first time, uh, And also, it also, uh, sorry, the fourth point was that uh, it uh, took out the landlords now. The landlords uh, that were appointed by the state, uh, all of them were uh, delegitimized. And each household became owner, owner of the land it tilled. So you had a direct relationship between the peasant and the state now. There was no intermediary. This was mid-60s. So each person, each household which had land, had a land certificate, owned a land certificate. Unlike during the earlier times when you had, you had the landlord system. So this was, in a sense, a certificate of economic citizenship, that you were entitled to land, and you had a certificate from the government that you tilled, you, you were an independent producer, was akin to economic citizenship. So this was a platform on which the independent peasant stood. He did not have to go through any intermediary, such as a landlord. You had the state, the government, and the citizen landholder. So this was a uh, very important component of citizenship. So in, this, in these four or five ways, uh, I think the land reform of the 60s and 50s, with the Birta abolition, abolition of rent-free land, uh, forest nationalization, and the series of land, reform, uh, land, reforms, land reform initiatives in the 60s, uh, a foundation was led, a very strong foundation was led uh, for, a, uh, for an economy and polity run by independent peasants. Now, uh, why do we think if independent peasantry was not strong, and if labor repression was high, why do we, how can we, why do we think uh, BP Koirala's then, at least then, center-left party won two-thirds of all legislative seats? You would expect, expect the royalists to win that 1961st democratic election in Nepal. Why did Nepali Congress Party win that many seats? Nepali Congress slightly left of center, Nepali center, Nepali uh, Congress Party, I argue, won that many seats, and four more were won, won by communist parties in a total seats of what, 109, I think? Uh, this was uh, an economy run by politically unaligned, unserf like independent peasants. They did not have to answer to a landlord or a superior landholding class in order to vote. So they spoke out their mind. This was the assertion of independence from the old traditional royal, etc. structures.
Now, coming to more recent times, uh, we see that 20 minutes? Uh, coming to more recent, recent times, you can see that the structure of production has changed greatly. Agriculture used to account for 70% of the gross dom domestic product in 1970. By 2010, agriculture contributed less than one third of total of all of the gross of gross domestic product. The rest was produced by other sectors. And this is a very telling statistic. 60% of all, and Nepal is known as an agricultural country somehow. Uh, by 2010-11, more than 60% of all males worked in non-agricultural sectors. Of course, there are very many women. A large proportion of women were tied with agriculture still, and even men are, but more than 60% by 2011 worked in non-agricultural sectors of all labor force, male labor force in the uh, economy. They worked in uh, the service sectors, uh, international employment, uh, city em employment, and so forth. The share of uh, farm income in total household income has come down drastically. So farm income accounts for only a small proportion, 28% uh, of household income. So much of income is derived from sectors other than agriculture. Mm. Now, why is that important? Because, once again, if we think of tasked labor, it is a characteristic more of agriculture than any other sector. So this also speaks, I think, of an independence of the political actors and voters. So one does not have to be beholden for most people. Most citizens are not beholden to landlords or uh, superior, quote unquote, superior people to speak out their mind in politics, in making claims, and in voting. So you have a platform in which democracy can rise. The only problem with capitalism in Nepal, I, this is my last point on this, is that it has, has not been able to, why has not capitalism developed f rapidly? Uh, I think this has to do with uh, uh, disarticulation. Now, what does this say? It's, what does this mean? This means that uh, income and profits derived uh, from any sector is not plowed back in that sector or in, uh, in any other sector within Nepal. Okay? Whether agriculture, for instance, agriculture is uh, tremendously under, under invested. So are many other sectors. So economic sectors do not receive the kind of investment they require in order to um, pay back the investment and produce a larger level of profit which can be reinvested again. And now I want to talk about, I spoke about capitalism and uh, democracy. I want to speak a bit about the relationship between class structure and democracy in Nepal. Of course, I have spoken a, a bit about it already, about the independent peasantry and so forth, but there are certain additional points I want to put, it, put before you. Uh, first, uh, three or four uh, critiques of uh, 
the idea of class. A lot of people, including Marxists, often interpret class as something that is always polarized. That you have this class and this class and th these always struggle. These always meet together and struggle. But if we read Marx and all other good Marxists, uh, they tell us that this kind of polarization is, uh, occurs only when a mode of production is mature, when it, when it reaches its peak. So you have two poles coming apart, you know, coalescing, very many classes coalescing into two, and these two coming together. But this is not often the case. This happens only during very short, specific moments in history. This is not the normal state of affairs. The normal state of affairs is differentiation between very many classes. And these classes cooperating and in conflict, but not in lethal conflict, not in the final conflict in cooperation and competition and conflict, but not in a conflict which seeks to annihilate one, one of the two. This is, this occurs, but occurs very rarely. This is not the normal state of affairs. This, the really coming together and fighting to, to the point of annihilation is a rare occurrence, although it occurs. Two, class in the literature has also been seen as a highly nationally bounded entity. That you have, you have a certain country and you have certain classes. You have another country, then you have an, another set of classes. Now, this, is, this does not work anymore. Because if you have a capitalist world system, not, capital, not capitalist system in Nepal, India, or China, or USA, or whatever, if those countries are fused together to create a world system, world capitalist system, then you have a system of class which is also not, which also cannot be bounded within the limits of a nation. You also have, you also have to analyze class as a world systemic phenomenon. Three, and unlike uh, in most literature, most class literature, the working class is not limited to the, as I said, as I said some of this earlier, is not limited to the manufacturing workers. The working class includes the so-called informal workers, the agriculture, all wage workers, including agricultural wage workers, one could argue, as I do in this paper, uh, by the way, uh, this I think would be distributed to all of you. Uh, I would argue that even the independent peasant can be classified as a worker, in as much as the independent peasant does not invest in order to make a profit. Finally, you have very many underemployed and unemployed potential workers. They, have to, they also have to be classified as workers. So if, if you count only the manufacturing worker as the working class, you have a very small sized working class. If you include all these, the informal, quote unquote, informal workers, the agricultural wage workers, the independent peasants and the underemployed and unemployed, you have a very large working class. Now, if we go back to the earlier theoretical <coughs> notes I put forward to you, before you, if it is the, if working class is pro-democracy, and now, if you include all these categories, except for the capitalists who invest and make profit and then reinvest it again as workers, 
then it is a very large working class indeed which pushes for democracy, not for other forms of governance, not for other government, not for other kinds of political systems. So, the reach of the 2006 political revolution was extended into the rural areas, which were becoming, the rural areas themselves, by the way, were becoming urbanized. I put urbanized under, under quotation marks. You can see why this happened. You have a really very large working class. who are not once again, who are not attached, who are not beholden to landlords or any other superior organizations or clans or families, Aristoc aristocracies. There are no such things now. That I submit this is the background to the 2006 revolution, 2006 Republican Democratic Revolution. add the enormous amount of number of underemployed and unemployed urban high school graduates and college graduates who are potential workers, not workers, not manufacturing sector workers, but potential workers who have a stakeholding in democracy, not in monarchy, not in feudalism. So the 2006, from this angle, the 2006 Republican Democratic Revolution becomes comprehensible. Now, uh, labor repressiveness, which has been is made a central point by Barrington Moore and uh, uh, very many authors as uh, a condition which, which is not friendly to democracy. Labor repressiveness, as I uh, hinted earlier, has been extremely weak in Nepal for a long time. Of course, there were unpaid labor obligations till the 50, 50s of very small scale. Okay? In, Nepali, in Nepali, they were called Bet Begar, but they were invalid, delegitimized in the 50s, and six, with the 60s land reform, this really almost died out. And then you had a whole uh, set of opportunities in schooling and education, which really expanded beginning the 70s. Uh, the scope for labor repression was further limited. And finally, with the expansion of migration, when you have now uh, almost 4 million international migrants and add migrants within the nation to that, it is nearly impossible now to repress labor. In fact, in many instances, landowners owe labor with advance payments for work that is to be done six months later. Labor is becoming scarce, much more scarce than it was in the past. Wage rates have risen several times within the last 10 years agricultural wage rates. So labor repression, which we are told by the big heads, is a condition where uh, democracy cannot take root, uh, has been invalidated uh, for quite a long time, the large-scale migration, beginning 1995, I suppose, had just about ended it. The, any regime of labor repression had just about ended with the expansion of the migratory regime. Uh, Okay, I, I skip one section and come to the section on the world and international context. Uh, 
As I said earlier, uh, the authors that I discussed, all of them have put extremely, uh, have given important role to the world and international context for a democratic revolution in a particular state. So it's not only the state which engages in revolution, it is the entire region or the world itself. So how was Nepal implicated? How, was, how were the international arena implicated in Nepal's 2006 revolution? Uh, in many ways. Let me, let me quote one uh, line from Barrington Moore. The fact that smaller countries depend economically and politically on big and pow powerful ones means that the decisive causes of their politics lie outside their own boundaries. Is that stark a sentence? Okay. And other authors, which I have, uh, which I uh, discussed, put out very similar lines. And uh, causes of democratic revolution uh, have an international character, not only a national character, uh, and more. Uh, there is a higher salience of international character if you are a smaller state, if, if you are underdeveloped state if you are, and in particular, if you are, if you lie sandwiched between two very powerful states and growing states, India and China in Nepal's case. And if you are a debtor, if you are in debt, you draw a lot of money from World Bank and Asian Development and Bank and so forth, you become a dependent nation and you are much more pliable for it. Now, we could discuss a whole lot about it, but then uh, that would take a lot of time. So I just uh, want to make a couple of points about uh, I mean, look at uh, a couple of points, points about how uh, international influence is, in, international influence impinged on uh, Nepali politics from uh, let's, I start from 1996. I wrote a, an article long ago, uh, which I have cited in this one, which showed that uh, the Maoist movement, the Maoists were not at all certain whether to go for a quote unquote people's war. They were extremely uncertain whether this was a wise course. But the revolutionary international movement RIM, RIM, was so insistent upon it. I've analyzed the uh, documents the CPNM, the Maoists, put out as a draft. And the kinds of comments the RIM wrote on the draft and the way it was finalized, that you could say that the RIM literally goaded the Maoists into a people's war. So even you are ideologically also, it's, you are very dependent. It's not only a state, even a party is an extremely dependent entity. The, 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 the justification for people's war came not from the Maoists primarily, but from the RIM. And with respect to the government of Nepal, you can, we can recall uh, very many influence, I'm not saying for good or bad, uh, that was put out by the international system, the UN. Uh, some of this I have reviewed here uh, in the paper. I do, not, I do not have time to go into it. Uh, and then eventually, as most of us are aware, uh, the 12-point plan was drawn up in Delhi, where the Maoist leadership lived for most of the duration of the People's War. Uh, the comprehensive treaty was, comprehensive peace treaty was drawn with the quote-unquote help of the United Nations. So you, have, you had a lot of uh, international influence into the shaping of the People's War and the Democratic Revolution.
one could argue that, in fact, one could argue that the lack of an agrarian focus in the Maoist People's War may have been due to Indian influence, government from Indian influence. If you recall, um, Baburam Bhattrai and many other Maoists, as Mao himself, justified People's War as, a, as an agrarian initiative. Baburam Bhattrai, for instance, has written that the objective of the People's War is to redistribute land to those who do not have land. I mean, agrarian relationship is at the center of any Maoist war, any Maoist politics. Now, if you review People's War from 96 to 2006, you are struck really by an absence of such an initiative. Now, I could be wrong, but one reason for it may be the Indian government. I mean, I'm guessing, almost guessing here. I put it out for your, your consideration. Two, People's War was fought intensely in the hills, less so in the Tarai Mades, and much less so along the border areas. Why is that the case? Again, this is a point to ponder. Was there Indian government influence on this? Now we'll have to analyze much more information on this, but this is a possibility. So I submit to you that uh, as the theorists I reviewed have said, uh, international influence is a big uh, shaper of democratic revolutions in anywhere. Uh, I conclude with uh, maybe five to ten lines. Revolutions, democratic or otherwise, do not take place at random. Revolutions take place within specific historical and structural contexts. Revolutions have specific historical structural causes. It cannot be willed by agents. Capitalism is foundational to democracy, although it is not sufficient for it. It is a it is a necessary condition for the rise of democracy, although it's not a sufficient condition, as I said earlier. Again, uh, the notion of class has to be redefined to include very many others, uh, working peoples, rather than manufacturing, work, manufacturing workers only. Uh, finally, international influence is a fundamental condition of revolution. This is so f particularly for small and dependent states which are neighbors to relatively enormously successful and powerful states. This tells me that the likelihood of similar upheavals in Nepal, such as that in 2006, is likely to rise if Nepal cannot mask the growth and power of India and China. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Mishra. That was an enthralling and a very engaging lecture. It really made us think about the different reasons behind the democratic movement and linking them together so seamlessly. It was a pleasure to be hearing it. Um, we would now break. I don't think we are taking questions at this point. So we will now break. And there's tea being served at the back. And please also pick up, I think the copies are, copies of the lecture should be at the back. Please pick up your copies. And thank you once again, everyone, for such an engaging and such a wonderful presence. Thank you.